thank you for coming today and today i'll speak <clears throat> on the shrimad bhagavatam we'll discuss a particular chapter from the ninth canto of the shrimad bhagavatam so i'll structure this class in three parts first i'll talk about spiritual knowledge and what its purpose is and how that purpose is furthered by the shrimad bhagavatam then second i will focus on the particular story which we are going to discuss today and then thirdly i'll talk about how it applies practically in our lives so after each of these sections i'll have a brief pause and if you have any questions or reflections i can discuss so we live in a age of science and we have phenomenal technological advancement in today's world so we may sometimes even think in such a age of science why do we need anything like spirituality why do we need scripture or such wisdom texts at all so broadly we can say that there are different bodies of knowledge science is the study of matter spirituality is the study of what matters science is the study of matter how do various material objects function how do they interact and this knowledge is very powerful however material knowledge itself doesn't tell what matters what is really of value in life that is a matter of values that is a matter of ethics albert einstein pointed out that science in itself is neither moral nor immoral it is a moral a moral means science itself does not contain any moral directive within it a person with say the knowledge of the nervous system can tell us that if you are having some pain you press your nerves over here and it can relieve you of pain but that same person can mislead and they can press the nerves in such a way that somebody might get a paralytic attack now both is both kinds of knowledge come from medicine from biology but now what is right what is wrong what is of value that is a different body of knowledge einstein said that we can talk about the ethical foundation of science but we can't talk so much about the scientific foundation of ethics so there are two distinct things in life there is what we live for and what we live with so suppose you see a neighbor suddenly rushing out from their home and rushing rushing to, to their car and driving fast so where are you going he says i am i'm going to put gas in my car okay but after that where will you go so then i'll go to the next gas station and put gas in my car okay but after that where will you go then i'll go to the next gas station no but where are you driving so i'm driving to the gas station that's strange now obviously we need gas for driving a car but gas is what we drive with it's not what we drive for so similarly in our life there are many things which we need for living that is the, the resources so and those resources are very important say we consider we need food clothing shelter we need air water we need some respectable position in society all these things are needed we, this is what we dry, live with but what do we live for science can provide us better and better resources to live with but what to live for that science itself doesn't tell us through science we can develop technology and through technology we can have access to all the knowledge in the world as it happens through the internet practically now but millions of people use this knowledge to spend their time playing video games and watching um, videos and basically not doing anything worthwhile so what we live with and what we live for are two distinct bodies of knowledge and the study of matter can give us more and more things to live with but what to live for that is the study of what matters and that is what spirituality provides us and in the normal course of our life we don't even think much about what is it that ultimately matters 
because we all have certain things which matter immediately. You know, I, I have to get food on my table, I have to take care of my family, I have to get this job done, I have to, the, I have to meet this project. But sometimes certain crisis comes in our life. And at that time, we start asking, what, what, is, what is it I am working for? So the Bhagavatam is spoken at such a time when there is a great king, Parikshit, and he is cursed to die in seven days. Philosophy actually begins with looking at death in the face. Because at one level, death is the ultimate meaning destroyer. Everything that we work for, it will be ripped away in one ruthless moment at that. So then the question comes, what, what will make my life meaningful? What is it that makes life worth living? So it is this question with which the Bhagavatam begins. Parikshit is about to die in seven days. And then at that time, he hears from the great sage, Shukdev Goswami, that Shukdev, that there is this world and beyond this, there is the source of the world. All of us are souls. And as souls, we are on a journey of spiritual evolution. So, our consciousness doesn't come from our physical shell. It comes from a non-physical, non-material core within us. And that soul goes from one life to another lifetime on a journey of spiritual evolution. Spiritual evolution essentially means that our consciousness expands to perceive bigger and bigger realities. A small child, their reality is basically, is or her reality is, I want some games to play with, I want some toys to play with. That's all. As we grow bigger, as we grow older, we said, okay, I have to get a career, I have to have a family. But as we evolve further spiritually, we think, okay, this is good, but what more? And that's how Thinking of, when we start thinking of the ultimate reality, then that is when we evolve most spiritually. So we are parts of a whole bigger than ourselves. That whole is known by different names in different traditions. The Bhakti tradition from India knows that whole by the name Krishna. So Bhagavat, Srimad Bhagavatam or Bhagavat Puran, Bhagavat refers to Bhagavan. That is, the Bhagavatam says Vishnu, Krishna, Ram, these are various names of that absolute. And it is to devote ourselves to the Absolute, to devote ourselves to the Lord and to learn to live in harmony with Him. So that we ultimately we attain love for Him and attain His eternal abode. So we live in a way, broadly speaking, the Bhagavatam says there are two aspects to our life. There is connection and contribution. Connect, we live in a way that we become connected with the ultimate reality. And then we live in a way that we contribute in this world. We contribute in a mood of service. We all have certain talents, certain resources, certain abilities. We use them in a mood of service. So what we live with is all our positions and possessions in the world. But what we live for is connection and contribution. So now there is a time for both of these in a life that is spiritually progressing. And Parikshit, he's now he's about to die. So what matters ultimately? It's not just winning a bigger kingdom, getting more wealth. He realizes that spiritual evolution is that what matters. And when he's about to die, at that time, he, he hears the Srimad Bhagavatam, which draws on stories from various parts of existence at various times, all for that one purpose of helping him to establish the connection. To focus his mind in devotion on Krishna. And the Bhagavatam has 335 chapters. Out of them, the heart of the Bhagavatam is the 10th canto. The 10th canto has 90 chapters, which is about which are about Krishna and his Leela in the world. And the whole idea is if we want to fix our mind on someone, we want to hear more and more about him. But at the same time, when we, see, whenever we want to go on a particular path, one thing is go on this path, the other is don't go on this path. You think a doctor normally gives two things. There are prescriptions and proscriptions. Okay, take this medicine, do this exercise, and don't eat, eat this food. Don't maybe if somebody has 
heart problems, don't smoke, don't drink, whatever. The prescriptions and proscriptions. So, in the 10th canto, the whole story of Krishna will be told where the prescription will be uh, will be facilitated, fix the mind on, on the divine, on Krishna. But what are the forces that distract us from Krishna? From the uh, things that really matter. So, those forces, how they distract and how we can protect ourselves. So, the ninth canto contains many stories which illustrate this power of temptation and distraction. So, broadly, there is the force of devotion which can take us towards the divine and there are anti-devotional forces which can take us away from the divine. And these are broadly classed into six categories. There is what we call as the six inner enemies. Lust, anger, greed, envy, pride and illusion. Kama, Krodha, Loba, Moha, Madha, Matsari. So now, this, this particular story, which is in the ninth canto, this talks about how one may get distracted by lust. So the whole idea over here is that there are, there are biological drives which everybody has. See, there is, there is a biological function, there is psychological obsession, and there is spiritual distraction. So, all living beings do the basic biological drives. That is, we human beings are, if you look from a biological perspective, we are designed in a way that we survive and reproduce. So, survival and reproduction. So, this is explained in the scriptural sense that we, for our survival, we need to eat, we need to sleep, then we need to defend ourselves from danger. So, this is all for survival and then, then there is reproduction. So, this is a biological function. But we humans are designed in such a way that we seek more pleasure than what the body can naturally offer. We seek, all living beings seek pleasure. All living beings are just driven by their biological drives. So, for, for example, a bird or animal, when the mating season comes, the hormones within them are stimulated, they get attracted and then they mate and they reproduce. So, when animals feel hungry, they will hunt for some food, they search for some food and they eat it. But we human beings, we are designed in such a way that we seek more pleasure than what the body can naturally offer to us. See, one example of that is, say, eating. With respect to food, if we consider a cow will eat the same grass day after day, month after month, year after year, decade, decade after decade. Generation after generation, cows eat, keep eating the same grass. But we humans, we don't just keep eating the same food. We have created hundreds of cuisines and hundreds of items within each cuisine. So, when we want the pleasure of eating, but we want it with more and more varieties. So, this is an indicator that since the, the soul is here, the body is here. And through the body, the soul can get some pleasure. But in the human form, our consciousness is so evolved that just the bodily pleasure is not enough for us. Now, when this bodily pleasure is not enough, what do we do? Broadly, there are two options. One is, we look for some non-bodily, non-physical pleasure. Look for some non-material pleasure. Is there something higher in life? Or, we look for material pleasure in newer and newer ways. Because, Whatever pleasure is naturally available, that is not enough for us. Just not satisfied with that. The soul, the, con the Atma is said to be such chit ananda. It is naturally joyful. And joyful means it is joy seeking constantly. When the soul realizes its spirituality, the soul becomes naturally joyful. But right now it is constantly joy seeking. So, the idea is, the soul is here, the body is here. Now, either we can look for more sense pleasure or we can look for something more than sense pleasure, some higher form of pleasure. These are the two broad paths. 
in our per, in our pursuit for pleasure and as long as we are captivated by the pursuit of by the hope that we'll get more and more sense pleasure then we don't look for something higher the nature of worldly pleasures is such that the pleasure appears to when it is not available it appears uh, it appears irresistibly captivating but when we get it it is it turns out to be momentary the bhagavad gita says that yehi samsparsha jab hoga dukha yona yevate that it is adi antavantah kaunte na te shuramate budha that adi antavantah kaunte that it is temporary this is 522 in the bhagavad gita it has a beginning and it is an end and dukha yona ishu that it is the the pleasure itself is the womb of trouble from the pleasure trouble will come why does that happen because when we get attached to the pleasure and then it is we get obsessed with it and then eventually it's temporary it ends it goes away and then we feel we feel disheartened by it so now this theme of how seeking more than sense seeking more sense pleasure can distract that is illustrated through the story of yayati can you you have a little display from somewhere the ninth the, you have the veda by somewhere mm. so this is a story of a great king ayati and the bhagavatam describes how these king how he as a he was a powerful king and let me know once it is done let me come you can just go to the relevant chapters and just go to the chapter chapter summary at this stage that's fine yeah okay chapter 18 so broadly i won't go into the full story here uh, can you just uh, go to the no go up go up this is io or vedavis.io or vedavis.com so this advanced view you just go to the just show the translations Tra- translations and so on go up go up this will have all translation just show the sanskrit and the verse okay good so can you go to around verse 20 okay okay yeah yeah just go down a little bit yeah you can read the translations okay so yayati thank you so yayati is going through the forest at that time he sees the, the this this lady this lady devyani she is in distress somehow she has had a quarrel with someone and she was pushed, pushed into a well so she has fallen in the well and she is calling out for help now when he sees her a damsel in distress he is a chivalrous warrior naturally wants to help her so he extends out her hand reaches down and pulls her out and then at that time now for her she has been trapped over there she did not know whether she will survive or not so she feels overwhelmingly grateful and attracted to him so he says that now that you have held my hand that now uh, we are bonded together this is that we were from different places just coincidentally we met and it is by providence that our bond is formed so now this is the stage where their relationship gets formed can you go ahead let me go to 25 Yeah, 
Mahatma Shukracharya listened to what happened to Devi Ramji. His mind was very much agreed. Condemning the profession of priesthood and praising the profession of Punch Bhutti, collecting grains from the hills, he left home with his daughter. Yeah. Can you go to the next verse? Explain briefly what happened. Yeah, go ahead next verse, please. Yeah, go ahead. Would like to read? So here what happened was that there was a Devyani was the daughter of a of a sage uh, of Shukracharya and now she had a friend Sharmishta who was a princess and she was much more well today she had her own maids so there was a squabble between the two of them and we won't go into the full history of that but so what happened at this point she felt that I had been insulted by Sharmishta so I want to get back to her. She thinks she is wealthy and powerful, but when I marry, she should become my maid servant. And now that is what exactly happens eventually. So Yayati, when he marries Devyani, so Sharmishta goes along with her maids, goes as her maid servant. So at that time, the <clears throat> now Yayati is a king. He is he is a powerful chivalrous person. And at that time, when he is living with Devyani, somehow a relationship developed between Sharmishta and, Devi and Yayati. And when this happens, Devyani becomes furious. So in the past, at one level, the kings would have polygamy. There are multiple reasons for that. Often the female population, the, num the female population was more than the male population and the kings would marry so, and the important thing was not whether there was monogamy or polygamy the important thing was there was responsibility even if there's a king had many queens it would be all taken care of but at this particular point Devyani had specifically said that, that he had warned that I want Sarmishta to be subordinate to me because they had their own ego issues and he said that you should not associate with her but when he found out that this is what has happened, when, but, but when some of the two developed a relationship, and then at that time when Yayati, Yayati's actions were found by Devyani, she became furious. And when she went and complained to her father, and her father became furious with him, and he said that you have no control over your senses, because of which you, you could not honor, you did not honor the promise that you made to me. Therefore, I curse you that you will lose your youth, you will lose your manhood, and you will not be able to unite with anyone. Now, that curse was devastating for the king, but then he realized, after the, the father realized, Shukachari realized that you know, by this curse, what will mean? What it will mean is that my own daughter will not have any children. So then he said that my curse cannot be taken back, but you can exchange this with someone else. You can, if some other young person is ready to give their youth to you and they take their old age on your behalf. So then you can be saved. So the whole event transpires and finally he found, finds a willing candidate and thus he gets his youth back. So at this particular point, the theme is that if you look at this, first there is 
a natural desire, natural male female attraction is there, then there is a normal marriage that happens, but then there is a the desire overgrows, it creates problems, and there is a consequence of that desire. But then again, that consequence is mitigated. And then he's restored to his normal situation. And so this is the whole crux of this chapter that Ayati regains his youth. Then we go to the next chapter, and the next chapter he finds that he becomes immensely, he is completely captivated and he forgets everything about everything else in the captivation of that attachment. And the nature of desire, the nature of attachment is that it consumes us. It consumes us means whenever any desire comes in our mind, initially it's a small desire, but it grows bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Nobody is who becomes say either alcoholic or a drug addict or anything like that. Nobody thinks I want I'm going to become an addict. But they do it once, they do it twice, they do it thrice. So it goes stronger and stronger. And then eventually, when we talk about attachment, attachment is nothing but psychological slavery. Now we live mostly in a world where there is no physical slavery. Uh, physical slavery has more or less been made illegal and removed, but attachment, specifically addiction, is like psychological slavery. And at that time, he realizes that that I have become immensely bound. Can you go to the next chapter and search for Najiriyato? We'll recite that verse. Ram Trishnam Dukh Nivaham Sharma Kamod Tantrajit Put command as Jiryato J-I-R yeah, Can you zoom it up? Command plus Okay. So, can we recite this verse? It's visible to everyone. Ya dustaja durmati bhir. Dustaja durmati bhir. Jiriyato vana jiriyate. Tam trishnam dukha nivaham. Sharma kamo drutam tyajet. So, ya dustya ja durmati bhir. So, now Yayati, he has spent a hundred years just obsessed. And then he realized, what did I do? I wasted so much time. So, then he is giving his realizations of how desires attach, become at, captivate us. This is dustya ja. Tyaja, tyaga is to give up. Dustya ja means that which is very difficult to give up. Durmati bhir. Durmati bhir means that that mati is consciousness. Durmati is that which takes the consciousness in an unwanted direction. Ya dustyaja durmati bhir. It's very difficult to give up and it makes our life difficult. It drags us here, there and everywhere. And then he says, jiryato vana jiryate. That means the body grows old but desire doesn't grow old. Generally, everything in this world, as it grows old, its power weakens. We have a, if we have a, nowadays of course phones and laptops, within a few years they get old, but a homes also, a cars also, after a few years they grow weak, maybe a dozen years, maybe a decade, several decades, whatever, but eventually they grow weak. But the nature of desire is that desire itself doesn't weaken by the passage of time. Of course, what happens is that as the body grows older, the body's capacity to satisfy the desire, to indulge in the desire may decrease. But the desire itself doesn't decrease. So then what happens? Tam trushnam dukha nivaham. That desire, that trushna, that craving, dukha nivaham. See, that craving itself becomes like a torture. It is like a dukha nivaham. Sharma kamo dutam tajet. I decide that I am going to give it up now. I am writing a book on spirituality and addiction. So I was talking with 
a friend of mine who is now a spiritual practitioner, but earlier he was an alcoholic. So he told me his story that he was living in Chicago and once he was, you no, know, he at night, like 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, uh, he had this sudden urge to drink. Now, Chicago you can be freezing cold. About five, six months ago, I was in, I was in Melbourne and my father was in Chicago. My father messaged me that at that on that day, in Melbourne the temperature was 45 degrees Celsius. Chicago was minus 45 degrees Celsius. <laughs> exact opposite. So at night it becomes incredibly cold. So he said, on the night, such a night he had the desire, I had to drink. Then he went to his fridge and he looked. He had no no alcohol with him. So he decided to go to the bar and he went to the nearby bar and he found that the particular he wanted to drink a particular particular beer which is not there so he got first i just want to drink this so he got one went back to his car and then he got into the car and drove to the other end of the city several miles away and suddenly his car broke down when he was about half a mile away and then he got out of the car and he ran and finally he got to that bar, it was freezing cold and he had been so frantic about going out that he did not even put on, put on adequately warm clothes. He was shivering. Finally he got there and he says, give me this. Then he put the money there, he took it and he opened it and drank it. And he said, he drank, he took a sip and he said, no, I put so much effort. I want to drink this I, peacefully, I want to savor this. So he, he put the bottle, carried the bottle and went back to his car and as he was going to the car, suddenly he slipped in the snow and what had happened was he had not put the lid properly. So the whole uh, beer which he had got it just spilled all over the body, spilled all over and then he fell in the snow and it was chilly and he looked around and he saw all around in this it was city, so it was all these big buildings, all lights closed and at that time it struck me. What am I doing? So that I could be sleeping comfortably in bed, and here am I lying in the cold without any warm clothes, bathed in beer. What am I doing? So that was the time it struck me that I am bound. I am bound. So if most often for us, what happens? We have desire, and most of the times our desire is not fulfilled. And that's how we feel unhappy. So we often think frustration of desire is the cause of unhappiness. And it's possible that frustration of desire is a cause of unhappiness. But quite often it is domination by desire that is the cause of unhappiness. Yes, I have this desire, I am unable to fulfill it, that's why I am frustrated. But having that desire in such a way that it dominates us, it drives us, it torments us, that domination of by desire is a cause of far greater unhappiness. So whenever we find ourselves dissatisfied, we all have many desires in our lives and some desires we can fulfill, some desires it's much more difficult to fulfill, some desires it's impossible to fulfill. And we often we often base our satisfaction on the satisfaction of our desires. And we think, why is this not happening? Why is this person not doing things like this? Why is this not working out? Why am I not getting this? Which is all fine, we all have desires and we will pursue them. But domination by desires is the recipe for frustration. So here, Yayati realizes, I have been dominated by desire for so long and I want to get rid of this domination. I want to break free from this. So now, after this, the remaining chapter is basically, he becomes enlightened. Now he has already, he lives in a culture where spiritual knowledge is not unknown. He's had sages who come and speak to him. But what happens for each one of us, that spiritual knowledge can be like light or it can be like lightning. What is the difference between light and lightning? What do you think? Yes, thank you. So lightning is one moment of illumination 
and darkness once again. So, light is where it is continuous illumination. So, basically, as long as we are very materially attached, and not just attached, but we are captivated. Okay, this is what I want, this is what will make me happy in my life. Then, even if we get some realizations, we get some we hear some illuminating knowledge, but if we hold on to that attachment, then that knowledge will come, knowledge will illumine for a few minutes, it will go away. But if we if we dwell on that knowledge, if we contemplate that knowledge, if we, if we are ready to, we all have attachments, but if we are ready to evaluate those attachments, so I believe this is what is this is what will make me happy, and I'm believing that because I don't have this, this is why I'm not happy. Is this really true? Is getting this really going to make me happy? So yes, we all want things in life, but reduce, but equating the fulfillment of a particular desire with with happiness, that is often a mis misconception. So, so now he had the spiritual knowledge. But in the past when he had heard it, it was all like lightning. But at this particular time, when he had indulged and he had realized, I am not satisfied, I am still frustrated, the desires are still not only present but they are growing. When will this end? That time the spiritual knowledge came to him and it was a moment of awakening. So the spiritual wisdom basically comes, how the spiritual knowledge that is to be internalized, that is to be realized. How does this happen? So this is basically the story of the Yati getting first entangled and then enlightened. So the third part I'll speak and with which I'll conclude is how does spiritual knowledge get internalized? I talked about started by talking about how spirituality is the knowledge of what matters. So we all have certain desires which we hold as very important. And the desires themselves are not a problem. It is domination by desire that is a problem. Like I talked earlier about that, that food, eating, survival, eating, mating, these are biological functions. But when they become psychological obsessions, then they consume our consciousness, they obsess us. And that's when it becomes a problem. So when, when we are going through our life journey, so broadly speaking, if say we our consciousness is here. The world is here and scripture is here. Spiritual wisdom texts are here. So what happens is, from spiritual wisdom texts we get some knowledge. And then from the world we get some experience. Now if there is no spiritual knowledge at all, then from the world we may get some experience. But what happens is, even if we pursue particular desires and get some frustration in that process or see it's one thing to get a desire or to have a desire and to not have the desire fulfilled and thereafter be frustrated. But it's even more exasperating if we have a desire, we fulfill the desire and then we find it's not fulfilling. Hey, this is what I lived for. It's, it's an anticlimax. What is this? Isn't there something more in life? So actually, the frustration because of not fulfilling desire is one kind of frustration. Frustration because the fulfilling of desire is not fulfilling. That is a bigger frustration. When this happens, at that time, if, if we just, if we know, have no spiritual knowledge at all, then that experience will frustrate us, but we will start thinking, Okay, this particular thing is going to fulfill me. Let me try that out. Let me try that out. Let me try that out. One of my friends is in the television advertisement industry. And he has told me that there is a survey done that when people, nowadays we have so many TV channels. So, people are most attentive when they are surfing through channels. Not when they are watching a particular channel. <laughs> because what happens, once we are watching a particular channel, we know the program, okay, sometimes it is exciting, sometimes it is boring, okay, it is going on. But when you are surfing through channels, maybe something new will come, something, something good will come, something good will come, something good will come. So what happens, similarly for us, if we focus only on experience from the world, then we will never get much, 
that experience alone doesn't make us experienced. We can have many, many experiences, but we don't really gain wisdom through that. It is when we have spiritual knowledge, which we hear, and then we look at the world through the eyes of spiritual knowledge. Then what happens? We start getting wisdom. See, if the world will tell us, this matters, this matters, this matters, this matters. But then, through our own experience, I, I give this so much importance, but does it really matter this much? Does it make such a big difference? It, it, it didn't give me that much satisfaction. Then we hear scripture. And then scripture tells us, this is what matters. That, that the gratification of our worldly desires doesn't matter as much as our connection with the divine. Maintaining that connection is most important. Do we have a whiteboard marker or something like that on chance? Can we? Okay, no problem. That's it. So you could just, I just I just wanted to illustrate this point. So for all of us when we go through a life journey, we as conscious beings are here. And the world will give us some experiences. So the world's experiences will make us experience, will make us wise, not just by our having those experiences, but by our learning from those experiences. And there are many things which you could learn, but the most important thing for us to learn is what really matters in life. So when we study from scripture and then look at the world through the eyes of scripture, that is called as Shastra Chakshu. That is Chakshu is eyes, Shastra is scripture. So that the eyes of spiritual wisdom when we look at the world through those eyes, then whatever experiences we get, we will be able to assimilate and learn more. Now, when we are like children, for example, they have built a sand castle, and somebody breaks their castle, they, are, they, are, they get furious. But adults, they know, okay, sand castle is not going to last for very long. They think this, this doesn't matter so much. So as we grow, our understanding of what matters changes. So when we learn spiritual knowledge, now what matters to us changes. Now this doesn't mean that the worldly things we become negligent or irresponsible. It is actually it is paradoxical. I'll conclude this point that it is paradoxical that the the more attached we are, the less responsible we can be. Why is that? Because when we are attached to someone or something, then our only focus is, I, I, if it's a thing, I have to get this at all costs. If it's a person, you know, I have to please this person at all costs. And sometimes in pleasing that person, we may do something which is bad for them, which is bad for us also. So there is, there is attachment, there is detachment, and there is commitment. Attachment is emo when we are emotionally locked in something. Detachment is when we are emotionally unconnected at all. And commitment is when we are emotionally invested. Emotionally invested. It is that, say if you have some money, you are invested it somewhere. Now if you find that this investment is not giving good returns, you can take it out. But if you put a money in a fixed bond which you cannot break, then the money is there and it is just locked over there. So for doing any for our for do, for doing our various roles and responsibilities in life, we need commitment. And attachment is often an enemy of commitment. When we are attached, then we get so consumed by things that we can't be responsible. Say so if if we have to do some project and then we become very attached to it, and if something doesn't work out, we become angry, we yell at others, we overreact. And actually, we make things worse by that. So, but if we are committed, yes, this is important. And then, okay, this thing is not going right. I won't get, I won't get too overwhelmed by it. So, we will be able to be stay more equipoised. So, when we, so that commitment comes when we have a higher connection. Uh, the higher the connection with Krishna gives us inner stability, inner strength, and that is what matters the most. And other things matter, but it is not that if something doesn't work out, my whole life is going to crumble. Yes, these things are, sometimes problems come, problems stay, problems go. I don't have to get overwhelmed by them. So we all 
can go on this journey of what we think matters from there to what actually matters. So this is Yayati's journey where he thinks initially that you know, getting the sensual pleasure by his relationship with either with the Devyani or Sarmishta or whoever else, that was the most important thing. He's completely obsessed with it. But then he evolves from there and he becomes enlightened. So we all can similarly evolve from whatever we think matters to what actually matters in life. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on this theme of the story of Ayati. Started three parts. First, I spoke that science is the study of matter. Spirituality, the study of what matters. Science can provide us more and more resources to live with. Spirituality can provide us the values and purposes to live for. And we drive a car not just to get to the gas station, but to go somewhere. Similarly, the body is, has its own needs. The body has food, has survival, that's food, <coughs> eating, sleeping, mate, uh, eating, sleeping, defending, and reproduction. These are biological drives. But for many many of us, this what is the biological function can become a psychological obsession. And then it can become a spiritual distraction. Now, why does it become psychological obsession? Because we human beings are in a position where as souls, we are so evolved that whatever pleasure the body provides is not enough for us. And that's why when we eat, we are not just satisfied with the natural food that comes, we want varieties of cuisines. Similarly, the biological function of mating, we try to get more and more pleasure through that in various ways. And that can entangle us. So basically, when we want more pleasure than what the body provides, either we can get more sense pleasure or we can look for something more than sense pleasure. So the story of Ayati is about how uh, somebody can get caught and obsessed with more and more sense pleasure. So he <coughs> initially rescued Devyani and he united with her. But then he was attracted by Sarmishta. That he bore the consequences of that and he lost his youth. But again, he, he by some arrangement got it back, but again he became entangled. And then finally, after indulging for a long time, when he realized that this doesn't give any satisfaction, that's when he got that illumination and he became enlightened. So, how can we all gain spiritual knowledge? I talked about how we, we, learn from scripture and then we experience in the world. So we all will experience frustration. We all may get some understanding by studying scripture. But if we hold on to our attachments, then that understanding will be like lightning. But if we are ready to re-examine our attachments, then it can become like light. And the way we get spiritual knowledge is that we don't just focus on the world's experiences that we're getting, but we learn from scripture and then evaluate our experiences in the light of scripture. Then, whatever we have grown up with the idea, this is what matters in my life. We evaluate. So, most of the times when we, are, we feel dissatisfied because of, because of frustration of our desires. But actually, dissatisfaction is caused much more by domination by desire. So, to not have a desire fulfilled is frustrating. But to have a desire fulfilled and to find no fulfillment thereby is even more frustrating. So, by our, by our experiences evaluated in the light of scriptural knowledge, we can grow from what we think matters to what actually matters. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Okay. So, how, what brought the enlightenment to him, and how will that enlightenment come in our lives? Yeah, it's a. It's there are two ways of looking at it. One is that 
sometimes wisdom it's it comes as a inspiration like uh, even in science uh, scientific study or any kind of you solving some problem sometimes you have the inspiration i should do this so inspiration is like a sudden movement of insight or illumination it's almost as if it is readily formed it has come to us mm. many prominent scientific discoveries when kekul discovered the benzene ring or many scientists they discovered it comes as an inspiration but however that inspiration alone is not the cause of the breakthrough because even the inspiration has come before that they have studied they have process they try to understand so and then when some insight comes they hey, this is really great they realize it when they are actually applying themselves so similarly for us there is we could say there is the process of regular spiritual study which we do and then that that makes our consciousness receptive it's like we we can till the soil and we can plow the land and then whenever we are hearing either spiritual knowledge at some particular point that seed fructifies so now when the seed will fructify that is that is mysterious we can't really predict that or control that but what we can do is we can try to we can plow the soil of our heart regularly so we try to hear and learn and apply as much as we can and sometimes that conviction will come upon us so in his case after indulging in sensual pleasures for a long time eventually when he still felt dissatisfied he still felt an insatiable craving within him so he could have again indulged in that pleasure but he thought what is this he says i have been indulging again and again and again when is this going to end when when will i be satisfied so that thought came at a particular time so that's it's it's a complex combination of what he had learned in the past what he had experienced at a particular time and it was all you could say fermenting in his consciousness and suddenly a uh, bubble of wisdom came up okay thank you any other questions yeah so actually vahana mein wala incident hmm Mm. yeah so is ananda a type of sense pleasure but it's not exactly sense pleasure although it can be it it can be pleasure experienced through the senses there is a difference between the two that is this is a physical level of reality this mental level this is spiritual level body mind and soul so now when we talk about sense pleasure normally what we refer to it is it is the senses interacting with the sense objects the senses are physical and the sense objects are physical the senses engage the sense objects there is some pleasure that is technically called as sense pleasure now for us the soul is here the mind is here the body is here or the soul is here mind is body is here so right now the soul's consciousness is primary channel channel through the mind and the body in principle the soul has got nothing to do with the mind and the body so you could say the uh, so there are four states of consciousness this is a technical subject but i just briefly mention it they are called as jagruti swapna sushupti and turya or samadhi so jagruti is the wakeful stage the stage in which we are right now hopefully <laughs> so it is that the consciousness comes from the soul through the mind to the body to the physical level that is jagruti then there is swapna where the soul the consciousness comes to the level of the mind but not to the level of the body that's why we have dreams when we sleep we experience things all the body is not experiencing much that is swapna then sushupti is deep sleep which is almost dreamless the consciousness doesn't come come even to the level of the mind and in turya is where the consciousness becomes freed from the mind and the body and goes directly to the spiritual level at the spiritual level it connects with the supreme spiritual reality with bhagwan with param brahma bhagwan and then there is parmananda over there hmm? 
So that is the stage of spiritual perfection when the soul becomes liberated from the mind and the body. At our level, the soul's consciousness is going to be rooted through the mind and the body. So what happens is that same divine who can be experienced purely by the soul at the spiritual level, that divine becomes accessible to us at the physical level. How is that? Say we go to a temple. There are the sacred images, the deities. Now the deity may be made of wood or marble or whatever, but through some special spiritual practices, spiritual ceremonies, the divine's presence is invoked over there. So then we are beholding the deities with our eyes, but actually we are connecting with the divine through that. Similarly, when we have the chanting of mantras, the mantras seem like ordinary sound vibration, but because they are referring to the divine, the divine manifests through them. So, at our level, even spiritual pleasure will be accessed through the senses. But however, what happens? Normally, if we focus on, if we use our senses to engage with some sense objects, then our consciousness becomes more and more locked at the physical level. But when we use our senses to, ex to connect with spiritual objects, like say the sacred text, like the deities, like the holy name, then what this connection actually strengthens our spiritual awareness. And then the, by that, by experiencing that spiritual happiness, even if it is experienced right now through the senses, gradually our consciousness starts expanding, becoming more and more receptive. And then eventually, even if the body-mind are not functional, we can experience spiritual happiness. So right now, yes, it will be experienced through the body and mind because our consciousness is caught in the body and the mind. But eventually, as we become purified, we will start experiencing more and more spiritual happiness independent of the condition of the body and the mind. Does it make sense? Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Sometimes study of scripture can also be overwhelming, or we may not. Okay. What is the optimum way of studying scripture? We might, when we find interesting, we might get overwhelmed and lost in that. Yeah, I don't think uh, it is a, it is a race. That it's not so much that, oh, I have read this book, I have read this book, I read this book. More important thing is to assimilate the values given therein. So generally, if we are studying books and also associating with those who are trying to live according to scriptural wisdom, then how this is to be applied becomes a more becomes clearer. Traditionally, if you consider, say, 300, 400 years before, before the printing press was developed by Gutenberg, books were very rare. So, most of spiritual knowledge was transmitted through the oral tradition, not so much through the written tradition. Books were written by scholars for scholars, and they had to be handwritten and replicated by hand. It was quite complex. So, I, so it's a very, very important for us to not just study the books, but also to avail of the oral tradition. So, if for example, now, if you decide to study the Bhagavad Gita, or now you are studying the Bhagavatam. So if you decide, instead of thinking that, oh, I have this book, I want to rush, I want to finish this book in the next one month or next 15 days or something like that. Yeah, we might read once quickly to get an overview of what is there in the book. But then it is good if you read something and then hear something on that. And then combine both. Then the reading and the hearing, when both of them are done synergistically, that's when understanding and application become much more clear for us. And the important thing in general is, there is no one right way to study scripture. 
because this is it's a process of spiritual evolution so we have to find the purpose is to nourish to be nourished so some of us might find that say even maybe memorizing some sanskrit verses and keeping those verses in our mind reciting them that's what nourishes us or some of us it might be maybe uh, <clears throat> just hearing the stories and the lessons drawn from it from different perspectives noting it down noting down some quotes keeping them with us that's what inspires us or maybe when we hear some some narratives and then there are some visual images that we see them and we cherish them and those are what inspire us so we have to find out what are the ways in which we can anchor our mind in krishna so there is no one way which is the right way we have to find whatever works for us and that we learn from experience and association okay. thank you so i think we stop here no. so thank you very much gantraj simad bhagavatam ki yeah. the prabhu pad ki jai